Hey everybody, I'm Andy Smith, your hostess with the mostess. I'm a 30 year comic book veteran, having worked for Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Image Comics, Cross Generation, Ominous Press, you name it, I've probably worked for them. And I do other things art wise outside of comics in the field of advertising. I've also written some books on drawing comics you might have seen, uh, drawing American manga superheroes, Drawing Dynamic Comics was my first book. And I also did the handy little How to Draw Superhero sketchbook where all you need is a pencil because you do all the work right inside the book. Enough about that. This is the Book Look series. The Book Look series is where I grab a book off my library. You can see the tons of books I have behind me. And I go through it page by page with you so you can see if it's a book that you might want to buy. I like to know what I want to buy before I buy it, and I feel this is a way to give you some insight into these books. So join me for today's book look. Thanks. Hello, everybody. This is Andy Smith, your host with the most 31-year veteran of the comic book industry, working for everybody, Marvel, DC, Valiant Acclaim, Image, and so on, and a lot more work outside of the comic industry as well. Check out my website, link in the description below, but it's andysmithart.com, pretty easy to remember. Today's book look is The Silver Age of Comic Book Art by Arlen Schumer. I've had this book for year, eons, if you will. I'm going to be gentle with it. Uh, this book came out in... Dun, 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 drum roll, please... 2003, so uh, almost 20 years ago, and it just goes over uh, artwork from the Silver Age. The Silver Age is a specific time in comics. You can see here, the there's an introduction, then we, uh, chapters on Carmine Infantino, Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, Gil Kane, Joe Kubert, Gene Colan, Jim Steranko, and Neil Adams. So it touches on those artists, gives a little introduction, talking about the Silver Age and when that time of comics was. Um, I believe the Silver Age started in 1959 when DC brought back heroes like The Flash and Green Lantern and Showcase. I want to say that's when, uh, when it started. And the Silver Age ended, I think, in like 79... If I remember correctly, I once again, guys, my book looks are me grabbing a book. I look at the spines of the books on my bookshelf. I pull them off. And uh, I haven't looked at this book. I can tell you for a fact, since I put it on the bookshelf when we moved into this house in 2013. So in nine years, I haven't looked at this book. So here we go. This is uh, Some of this is going to be uh, like new to me because I haven't seen it in a while. I don't know if this book is still available. You'd have to uh, just look online and do a Google search. If a book is available, I'll usually post the link in the description below. The thing I like about this book, tons and tons of artwork. Some of the text is hard to read, I gotta say. Some of this stuff right here, not super easy to read with the art behind it. Beautiful Joe Hubert work, of course. This is Neil Adams' work. I believe we're still in the introduction. So the introduction is pretty long. Love that face. Just love that, the emotion and stuff on it. Here we go. Chapter one, Carmine Infantino. This is detailed from The Flash. When he drew The Flash in that showcase, it was actually inked by none other than Joe Kubert. The thing I like about this book is below each drawing, he lists where it's from, the issue number, the year it came out. So if you're looking at a drawing, you're like, man, where's that from? Have no fear, it's listed. Carmine had a very distinct style with his work. His architecture is one thing I really loved. 
it was kind of Frank Lloyd Wright-ish in a way. Uh, when he inked his own stuff, it was a lot uh, scratchier and not as clean compared to when somebody like Murphy and Anderson or Joe Giella inked him. Man, I should have pulled this book off the shelf a long time ago. He had a long run on Batman. See, this is inked by Murphy Anderson right here. But you, if you know Carmine's work, you can still look at it and be like, oh yeah, that's Carmine. When, uh, when Neil Adams started at DC, he would do covers over Carmine's layouts. See, Carmine did a lot of his own inking on Elongated Man, and you can tell from the inking style because it's looser. Which I like. I think it's pretty cool. I can't. I read somewhere what type of pen he was using, but I can't remember what now. This classic shot of Batman and Robin. I just love this. I love seeing Murphy Anderson's inks over uh, Carmine's pencils. I thought they made a really nice team. Same with Joe Giella. Joe Giella really did a nice job as well inking Carmine. Carmine was an art director for a while at DC. He was an editor at DC. He drew the first Dead Man story, I believe. And then after that, Neil Adams picked up the mantle. Now we move on to Steve Ditko. How do we know Steve Ditko? Half the creative team of Spider-Man. Half the creative team of Doctor Strange. And yes, I know some people will say, what are you talking about? Stan didn't do anything. It was all Steve. Well, I wasn't there. It's, it says credit for both those guys, so that's what I'm going with. But Steve worked on a book for Charlton called Captain Adam, which I loved. I loved this gold costume before he became all shiny and chrome when DC took him over. But of course, like I said, he's best known for Spider-Man. 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 Does whatever a spider can. He spins a web. So cool in that. I don't know the words. Let's move on. Did you know Spider-Man's costume was originally black and red? And there were just little highlights to show form for the blue. And then as years went on, artists would stop doing a lot of the black and just doing doing it so it was colored more blue, so everybody's like, oh, his costume's blue and red. So it was actually black. So in shadows and stuff, you could do cool stuff like this. This is very Frank Miller looking, actually, right here. Some of Steve's classic poses, each one saying what book it's from. So if you're like, I love that, go get Spider-Man 21. I'm still more of a John Romita fan. Yes, I'll say that than uh, Steve Ditko on Spider-Man. But when it comes to Doctor Strange, it is Steve Ditko hands down. He created the world. He created all the, the weird stuff and the different universes and, and whatnot. Places that Doctor Strange would go. All that trippy stuff. That's all Steve Ditko, and then guys like Frank Bruner would want woo, Frank Bruner would run with it when he did Doctor Strange. But you got some of the tri trippy stuff here. They did a really good job putting all this type of junk in the movie. I thought I know why I left Marvel, but no one else in the universe knew or knows why. Steve Ditko was a recluse. You, I mean, I've only seen one picture of that guy. Actually, I've seen two. One from when he was working on Spider-Man way early on. He was at his desk. And then one, I believe, when he was probably in his 60s. And that's it. He didn't do conventions, didn't care about autographs and stuff. He also created the, uh, co-created the Blue Beetle, the Creeper. I've got the Creeper issues. I think they're really cool. He's creepy. He did do Hawk and Dove as well, which he didn't do the whole run. And it wasn't like Hawk and Dove lasted that long. It was, what, five, six issues, something like that. Steve did a few of them, but then Gil Kane took over. So I'm glad because I like Gil Kane, but this 
Steve's take was really, really cool. Uh, our buddy, Art to Bear, from a show I'm on called The Professionals. Art to Bear is a fantastic inker. Actually got to ink a Green Lantern job over Steve Ditko. Jack Kirby. Now, why Jack wasn't first, I'm not exactly sure. It could, well, you know what? Mm, Carmine was doing stuff at DC in, in 59. Ditko was, bef was after that. Then Jack. Yeah, I guess I can see why. Of course, the first uh, Fantastic Four. Jack was a powerhouse of creativity at Marvel. The different iterations of the thing. And it's weird because you look at the thing now, see, no teeth. No teeth, no teeth, no teeth. You figure he's got to have them because he has to eat. But, but, I like seeing him drawn with no teeth. And artists these days draw the thing with teeth. I also like this uh, this is very John Byrne, but it's Jack Kirby. And of course, you know, Jack, John was influenced by Jack Kirby. So you can see how he constructed his thing the way Jack Kirby did. But I love the way he's constructed here. I also don't think the thing, like, you see the Hulk in comic books, and it's, he's just huge, you know. But the thing to me, should stay to whatever size, like, you know, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, whatever he is. Of course, we have the Hulk here. He started off gray, then he went to green um, because of some printing error, I believe. This is just a classic version of the Hulk coming forward. And this is where I'm torn. I love drawing big, monstrous dudes and I've drawn the Hulk on various sketch covers and commissions and and things really jacked out huge. But I really like this size of the Hulk as well. It's just stocky and stubbier. Of course, Thor. Great Thor run by Jack and mostly Vinny Coletto on inks. It's a great team up. Jack, Captain America, he created Captain America with Joe Simon back in the day. Came back, did him for Marvel. Like I said, Fantastic Four. I might have led with Fantastic Four. He was really creative doing photo montages in the background and stuff. Stuff that was just ahead of its time. And of course, then Humans, my favorite this shot of Black Bolt takes up the top half of a page in the issue of Fantastic Four. I freaking love it. I love the way Kirby, with his, his stylized anatomy, would construct figures. Joe Sinnott was doing the inking on this, making Fantastic Four look so slick and clean. I know it's small, but this, this shot of Triton right here, just coming at you in great perspective. Man. I could geek out on Kirby. Look how tight these pencils are on this two-page spread. Insane. Insane in the membrane. Insane in the brain. The design of Galactus's ship, which is still used to this day. And of course, the Silver Surfer. Flying on the skyways. Uh, these, this is from issue 72. This is it from 48. The first graphic novel Marvel put out was The Silver Surfer by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Hopefully there's art in it. I love this pose of the surfer right here. Love this too. Jack Kirby, this is New York. He's just drawing stuff. Doesn't look like New York. Who cares? Who can bring down the surfer? Dr. Doom. Bring in the pain. Like I mentioned, Thor. Thor's comic originally started in Journey in the Mystery. Instead of starting with a new number one, they just picked up with uh, Journey in the Mystery 120, 
five, and then Thor 126 was the first standalone Thor. He was fighting Hercules in it. Over at DC, he does the New Gods. And then we get to Gil Kane. As a kid, I thought it was Jill. I soon learned it was Gil. One of my favorite Green Lantern artists, Gil Kane. If you look at, you know, Neil Adams took over Green Lantern after Gil. But if you look at Gil Kane's Green Lantern, a lot of the perspective, foreshortening and stuff that Neil was doing, Gil was doing first. Nothing against Neil. I love Neil Adams, but Gil was kind of doing it first. He also had, also had a nice stint on the Atom. And he actually came back in the 80s and did uh, Sword of the Atom miniseries. Two of them, I believe. Uh, Murphy Anderson, who was kind of like uh, Joe Sennett at DC. Whereas Joe inked a lot of guys at Marvel. And Murphy inked a lot of the heavy hitters at DC. Uh, yes, Gil would swipe stuff. This is Jack Kirby punching Baytrock. Oh, look, Gil's like, that's a great pose. I'll use something like that for uh, Green Lantern punching this bad guy. And then in uh, Captain America, he's like, you know what? I'll use that pose as well. So Gil would throw down the little homage as well, you could say. Uh, he did Captain Action, but my favorite, one of my favorite Marvel characters Captain Marvel, Gil drew two issues? It's either two or three issues of Captain Marvel. Was it? That's the cover to 17. I don't think he drew 17, though. I don't know. I can't remember, but man, I wish he would have done more. His last issue of Captain Marvel, he actually split with John Buscema. So it was cool to see John Buscema draw some Captain Marvel. On to my man. Joe Kubert, I went to Joe's school, the Kubert school. I had Joe as a teacher for two years. Joe personally interviewed me and looked at my portfolio to get into the school. I am a huge, huge, huge Joe Kubert fan. Let's dive in. This book right here is one of my favorite covers that Joe did. He was like 19 when he drew this cover. Yes, I own this actual comic. I actually got it CGC graded. It's hanging up on my wall. I love that cover. Love that Hawkman for somebody that was only 19. Uh, I have a couple of Joe's original Hawkman issues, but I have the trade paperback in full color of all of Joe's Hawkman. I have the black and white showcase of all his Hawkman. But what is he really known for? Sergeant Rock and Easy Company. Every member of Easy Company has a distinct face. None of this cardboard cutout stuff with just a different hairstyle. All very distinct, so you can tell them apart. Sergeant Rock is this grizzled uh, sergeant in the army. I love the way Joe just indicates the bullets here. Instead of drawing out each one meticulously. Of course, he worked on Enemy Ace. A World War II book. Beautiful plane. Joe pretty much freehanded everything as well. So, I mean, this looks like a ruler, so maybe he ruled some stuff. I was taught that on, say, a plane like this, if it was in pencil, rule the major lines and you can freehand the rest. And because your eye sees the stuff nice and ruled, straight and perfect, the stuff that is freehanded uh, will fit right in. I guess that's a good way to say it. I mean, Joe was just a master of black and white uh, artwork and gray tones. Short chapter. All right, Gene Colon. Mean Gene Colon, the Invincible. Oh, yeah. Gene worked on Submariner, worked on Iron Man, drew Iron Man number one. Gene's another guy with very stylized anatomy. I love it. I love the power. Yeah, anatomically correct? No. Power Yes. Look at this Iron Man right here at the bottom from issue one of Iron Man. His legs are spread so far apart, he's almost doing the splits. That is powerful, baby. 
Had a nice run on Daredevil as well. The way Gene Colan would spot the blacks on Daredevil's costume and just in his work in general. If you want to look at a way somebody really spots nice shadows and black areas on a page, look at Gene Colan. Uh, I'm a superhero guy, so my favorite stage of Doctor Strange was when he put on the mask in a skin-tight costume and became a superhero for a little bit. More traditional superhero. Jim Steranko, the guy that didn't draw many comics, but left such a huge mark on the comic book industry for the handful of books that he did. He had a long run on S.H.I.E.L.D. drawing Nick Fury. He's another guy whose anatomy was kind of wonky. Very Bern Hogarth in his anatomy, but I dug it. I thought it was so cool. He did two issues of the X-Men that I thought were just awesome. He did two issues of Captain America that are just my favorites. Love this Nick Fury shield here. Kind of a homage to this Wally Wood guy here. The way he would do these covers with just different iconography and stuff. He'd work in logos like Will Eisner did with the Spirit. He would try to work in that way. His design, this is a two-page spread from an issue of Captain America he did. And once again, it's kind of wonky anatomy, but it is just so freaking cool looking, if you ask me. And uh, I say it is. But then look how trippy this is. This Hulk cover. They did redraw the face. That is not the Jim Stranko face. It was redrawn. Great Captain America, though. Another great... This is inked by Joe Sennett. Seeing Joe Sennett, Like I said, Joe Sennett inked a lot of the heavy hitters. Beautiful cover. Right here by Jim. Great, great shot of Captain America. Classic uh, Strange Tales starring Nick Fury and the S.H.I.E.L.D. This is what I mean by working in nice graphics here. Some nice storytelling right here just inside the logo itself. Nice two-page spread here from this Captain America work. Beautiful splash page that I've seen drawn by different artists homaging it. But this is what I mean. Will Eisner would do the spirit and do something cool with the title on the splash page. Who is Scorpio? And Jim's like, that's a good idea. Aaron Lepresti is a big Jim Steranko fan and will do stuff like that in his books. At the stroke of midnight. Dun, dun, dun. And then, I believe, is Neil Adams? Neil Adams might be the last one. So we'll see. Neil, very inventive. Youngest strip artist ever. I believe he was drawing Ben Casey when he was like 19 or 20 years old. Look at this. I love how he designed... You can see the whole head. So you got the globe in the first panel. In the second panel, the head carries through with the jacket. In the panel below, the head comes down. And if you separate it out, it's just the, you know, the ear close up in the foreground. Then you come over to this panel and you've got the close up of his eyes. You come down here and there's like this shadow or something on the wall that carries his chin down. And then here, see if I can do this. You guys can see it. It's a lamp. That's a lamp he designed in the foreground. But when you see it, the arm carries through the side of his cheek, his chin. This is his nose on top of the lamp. That's his mouth. I mean, ingenious. And then boom, here he does it again with Dead Man. You can see this whole dead man face go through all these panels and it's just ingenious. I mean, in this panel, the nose, that's dead man's arm. This is his back. He's got uh, dead man's, uh, the top part of his butt kind of forms his mouth. I mean, just, just beautiful. Very inventive. Neil's layouts were in your face, dynamic, really pushing the perspective. 
but he had more of a realistic way of drawing that even though he would use photo reference for lighting and stuff like that, it still has a nice comic book feel to it. I mean, look at all the faces on this page and how each one, the expression, you can just feel it. Feel it. I, uh, he was influenced by Steranko in a sense, where like this is Steranko here, but then Neil would do trippy stuff like that, kind of what Steranko did. Um, here, he this even says, hey, a Jim Steranko something, which is like his little tip of the hat to Jim. But these are the page layouts. Neil will do, instead of just uh, typical squares or rectangles, he would do these really funky page layouts. And look at this. Your eye just flows through the page. Dead man's here. This guy's walking. Dead man's flying over. He's walking. Dead man comes down. He's like, I'll inhabit this guy's body because that's what dead man does. The dude's coming out here. He's like, I'll get this guy's body. Boom, goes into it. One whole background divided with gutters so you see the separate actions. Beautiful. This one's a little more difficult to read because he falls out of the window here. He gets bumped out of the window and then you're supposed to go up to here and then you read down as he's falling so you get the sense he's falling and then you shoot back up to here. Uh, kind of works, kind of doesn't. But you know what? You got to try these different things. He created Havoc, designed them. Very cool, simple design. This is cool to see... Uh, Neil, when he does a rougher page, the rough is small, and then he'll blow it up and trace it off. This is how tight his rough is. And then that's the finished panel. More stuff from DC and Marvel. Once again, another great two-page spread doing panels inside of Sauron's wings. You've got Batman here. His cape blows out, and he's doing that, a panel inside of that. Nice profile here with the panels inside of that. Just really cool inventive stuff. Of course, I remember growing up. I, this is one of my. This is my favorite issue of Green Lantern. It's Neil's first issue. He penciled and inked the entire issue. After that, Dick Giordano inked some of the stuff. Frank McLaughlin did. Bernie Wrightson inked an issue. I think Neil might have inked one or two more issues by himself. But the first issue, he's like, I got it. Pencil and inks by Neil. This is from that issue, three panel sequence. Just a beautiful drawing of the upshot of this head is stuck with me forever. So nice. The proportions on Green Lantern, he's not overly jacked. He's, he's thin and wiry, just super cool. He, of course, uh, created Jon Stewart, who would become a uh, backup Green Lantern. This is one of my favorite covers right here. Uh, famous anchor in the business, Scott Williams, owns this original art. So envious. This character's obviously based on someone. I'll let you figure it out. Or as uh, Neil says, you don't get many opportunities to do Jesus. So there you go. And this is the cover of one of his sketchbooks. We get to the back of the book. He does his bibliography and sources. So you can see where every panel is from as well. It's a really, really well-referenced book. If you're into Silver Age art and history, I highly recommend The Silver Age of Comic Book Art by Arlen Schumer. I don't know if it's available. You might have to check eBay. Thank you guys for joining me on this exciting adventure. Remember, you want a great comic book? First Man, two volumes, self-contained stories, 64 pages each by yours truly. You will love this book. Link in the description below. Go get it. My new project is Cordrath, The Reckoning. What is Cordrath? Cordrath is a barbarian. If you like Dungeons and Dragons, if you like Conan, if you like He-Man, you will love this book. 
There's a link in the description below for that as well. Check that out. Guys, thank you so much. My channel is growing. It's because of you guys. I really appreciate it. If there's any book looks you'd like to see, throw out a suggestion. I might have the book. I read all your comments. I comment back if you ask questions. Join me next time on another book look. Like, subscribe, you know, hit that thumbs up, subscribe, and uh, hit the notification bell so you know when I go live, live from North Carolina. I'll catch you guys later. Bye, everybody.